My name is Katie Bonavento, and today I'll be presenting my paper, A Vague and Voiceless Yearning, Stages of Development in the Search for Identity in Shirley Jackson's Hanks Man. My paper examines Shirley Jackson's second novel, Hangs a Man, through the lens of developmental psychology. Its plot follows a young woman named Natalie Waite as she leaves for college and grapples with an existential crisis. Drawing from ideas pioneered by Jean Piaget, the paper will argue that Natalie's character development throughout the novel mirrors the stages of development through which children pass as they grow up and eventually mature into adults. Natalie's leaving for college is positioned as a rebirth, but her development is arrested by trauma. Because of this, she remains mired in the childish egocentrism of Piaget's pre-operational stage. As she descends deeper into turmoil, she even loses her sense of object permanence, or the awareness that things continue to exist while they are out of one's sight. Key to this regression is Tony, an imagined figure that personifies Natalie's ideal self. However, it soon becomes apparent that the complete freedom from reality that Tony offers is a childish conception of adulthood, and in order to truly grow up, Natalie must leave Tony behind. This abandonment of childhood is bittersweet, but at the end it's clear that Natalie can now face her future with confidence. I've divided Natalie's progression throughout the novel into several phases, starting with the beginning of the journey. Natalie begins the novel as a blank slate. Even her name is derived from the root natal. One of the first things we learned about her is that she was 17 years old, but felt that she had been truly conscious only since she was about 15. Effectively, she's two years old, placing her in between Piaget's first two stages of cognitive development. She feels that she lacks a workable personality and spends much of her time immersed in fantasy to escape her dysfunctional family. These fantasies reveal much about Natalie's mindset. She imagines being burned alive to chase away worries about growing up and pictures a detective questioning her throughout the novel's first chapter. In her conversations with the detective, Natalie adopts a confident persona that hints at her desires for control and maturity. I may be in danger every moment of my life, she says, but I am strong within myself. These fantasies indicate that Natalie is not satisfied with her current reality and recall a child's fascination with imaginative play. Natalie's desire is encapsulated by a woman named Verna, who she meets at a party early in the novel. Never rest until you have uncovered your essential self, she tells her. Somewhere, deep inside you, is a clean, pure being made of radiant colors. Natalie wants to find this idealized identity, but she's too caught up in others' perceptions of her to be truly confident in who she is. Her incessant worrying about what others think leads her to dissociate from reality. Later in the aforementioned party scene, it's implied that she is sexually assaulted by a man who takes advantage of her distraction. As he leads her away, Natalie wonders if perhaps he is now talking to some Natalie he thought he had hold of. Even when she faces a clear physical danger, she is too focused on the way her assailant perceives her to completely register what is going on. This demonstrates the developmental psychology concept of ego boundaries. Natalie cannot yet conceptualize that there is a me separate from everyone else and believes that others' perceptions of her define who she is. It's at this point in the novel that Natalie leaves home for college, where her egocentrism begins to devolve into delusions of grandeur. Natalie's leaving home initially seems like a positive change, but it's clear that her trauma has stunted her growth. Instead of completely dissociating herself from her father, she continues to write to him, as well as developing a fixation on her English professor, Arthur Langdon, who serves as her father's double. She also denies the truth of her assault, repeating the phrases, I don't remember, nothing happened, over and over in her mind. Natalie's constant self-obsessed worrying intensifies. In a scene where she meets the other girls living in her dorm, she spends the whole time wondering what they think of her rather than attempting to befriend anyone. She copes with this fear of being placed in a box by her peers by isolating herself. However, this backfires when she finds out that the other girls term her crazy and spooky because she shuns their company. This revelation causes Natalie to retreat even deeper into what she calls her own sweet, dear home of a mind. Her egocentrism softens the emotional blows caused by her social rejection. You are the best, she writes to herself in a journal entry, and they will know it someday. And someday no one will ever dare laugh again while you are near. 
and no one will dare even speak to you without bowing first, and they will be afraid of you. Taking refuge in her own possessive pride in herself, Natalie's dissociation from the real world becomes even more pronounced. But the state of narcissistic self-assurance is not to last, and when it inevitably collapses, Natalie begins questioning reality. Natalie's fixation on others' perceptions of her remains strong, and it becomes clear that her conviction of her own superiority is merely a superficial affectation that is undermined by her desire for others' validation. She looks to Arthur Langdon as the main source for this validation, and is continually disappointed. He ignores almost all of Natalie's efforts to impress him, and she realizes that he is more interested in his older, more confident students, Anne and Vicky, than he is in Natalie. As Natalie becomes more involved in Langdon's life, she befriends his wife Elizabeth, a former student of his. When Tony appears later in the novel, she represents the person Natalie dreams of becoming. Elizabeth is just the opposite. Self-destructive, lonely, and an object of mockery for the people around her, she's a representation of what Natalie fears becoming. Mocking Elizabeth, Vicky says, no one understands that I only want everyone to love me. Without realizing it, she also describes Natalie's desire for others to view her as superior. Natalie's interactions with the Langdons, Anne, and Vicky lead her to realize that the people around her don't see her as the powerful and intelligent figure that she imagines herself to be. She is latched onto this feeling of superiority and absence of a fully formed identity, and questioning it leads her to question reality as well. The quote displayed here summarizes her internal conflict. Perhaps, and this was her most persistent thought, the thought that stayed with her and came suddenly to trouble her at odd moments and to comfort her. Suppose, actually, she were not Natalie Waite, college girl, daughter to Arnold Waite, a creature of deep lovely destiny. Suppose she were someone else. The thought of being someone else is too frightening for Natalie to fathom, and thus begins her descent into unreality. It's here that the figure of Tony emerges. She's initially mentioned in one of Natalie's letters to her father. Natalie expresses a desire to meet her, then comments that, Now that I have mentioned I would like to meet the girl Tony, I will certainly meet her soon. This belief that she is able to manifest events just by speaking about them is a sign of Natalie's increasing delusional beliefs as well as an example of the incorrect folk intuition that characterizes children's reasoning in Piaget's pre-operational stage. The novel's end reveals that Tony is not a real person. Rather, she is an imagined figure that only Natalie can see. From a perspective of developmental psychology, then, she can be cast in the role of an imaginary friend. In a 2017 study, it was found that imaginary friends serve many purposes for a developing child including to escape reality, to overcome loneliness, and to serve as a manifestation of the child's ideal self. Throughout the novel, Tony plays all these roles for Natalie. Her reassurances to Natalie that she needn't think she's the only one recall Natalie's earlier wish for a person who is thinking about me and who watches me and knows everything I think about, and her promises to show Natalie fantastical things offer an escape from the mundane reality that Natalie dreads. Most importantly, Tony personifies the concept of the essential self that Natalie's been striving for since the novel's beginning. Tony is everything that Natalie wants to be, free, self-assured, and unaffected by others' opinions. Natalie's daydreams of godlike strength persist. In one scene, she imagines being a giant and eating her peers alive, but Tony is able to speak her own power fantasies aloud. Someday I shall be allowed to torture the other students, she tells Natalie. I believe I shall take them one by one and peel them like apples. Natalie wants Tony's power, yet cannot integrate it. This aspirational fascination draws her further into her own interior world. With Tony leading the way, Natalie is now compelled to make her departure from the familiar. Natalie's dissociation from reality reaches its climax at this point, when she and Tony leave campus early in the morning one day and explore the surrounding small town together. This is her first step into the kind of freedom that Tony is emblematic of. She's excited to have a world ahead of her and no one to know at any time where she is. Encouraged by Tony, she indulges in elaborate fantasies and seems to even believe them. She wonders if the college has faded away just because she and Tony have gone, indicating a lack of object permanence. This is only one example of Natalie's increasing inability to distinguish fantasy from reality. She imagines the items in a drugstore to be magical talismans, and fantasizes with Tony about Elizabeth Langdon coming to meet them, bringing jewels, papers, and guns. 
An important episode during this period is Natalie and Tony's encounter with a one-armed man in a restaurant. He's the only person to directly acknowledge Tony, suggesting that he too is a figment of Natalie's imagination. The day in town is mostly peaceful, but a turning point is on the horizon. Natalie must soon realize the danger she is in and prepare to defeat her enemy. Here, Natalie and Tony's perspectives begin to diverge. While Natalie has grown tired, Tony is eager to continue, powered by her anger at the real world and the people that inhabit it. They want to pull us back and start us all over again just like them, she tells Natalie, but tempers this fear-mongering with the tantalizing promise that she can bring Natalie to a place where no one can trouble us. Natalie agrees to go with her, but it is clear that this agreement comes more from fear than from her own will. Natalie comes to regret this choice when Tony leads her onto a bus and promptly disappears into the crowd. To Natalie, everyone other than Tony are mere automatons, playing a bit part in the great dance which was seen close up as the destruction of Natalie and far off as the end of the world. Her ego boundaries have completely evaporated. She has inflated the interior drama of her search for an identity into an all-encompassing catastrophe. When Tony reappears, she becomes more cryptic and threatening, hinting at her own nature when she tells Natalie that if you invent someone smart enough to destroy your enemies, you invent them so smart you've got a new enemy. The two girls finally arrive at an abandoned amusement park, far from the point where they began. They have finally left reality behind, and Tony has gained a new dominance because of it. As Tony delves deeper into fantasy, Natalie withdraws back into reality. When Tony speaks of stamping on the ground and calling down anything she wants out of thin air, Natalie sardonically responds, not in this mud you couldn't stamp. She is beginning to realize that the complete immersion in fantasy that Tony represents is childish and unrealistic, and to grow up she will need to leave the part of her that is Tony behind. As Natalie wakes from her fantasy, Tony starts to fade, at times reduced to a voice dying away. Natalie begins to look at the situation logically telling herself that people are only afraid of other people, and that there is nothing menacing about Tony's schoolgirl joke. The turning point comes when Natalie arrives at a clearing and Tony reappears, denying that she ever left, and forcing Natalie to stay until some undefined event happens. The whole scene, down to the remote setting among the trees at nighttime, parallels Natalie's assault, which she has denied throughout the entire story. Tony embraces her, and Natalie thinks, horrified, she wants me, recalling her reaction to the earlier assault. Natalie's rejection of her offer to withdraw permanently from reality has caused Tony to evolve into an avatar of Natalie's deeply buried trauma. But now, Natalie recognizes what she is faced with. She tells Tony, I am not afraid of you. This statement refers both to Tony and her previous assailant. She has finally come to terms with what happened to her. Natalie has grown up and defeated her self-destructive impulses, but her departure from childhood is unsurprisingly bittersweet. What did I do wrong, she wonders. Even though Natalie has grown tremendously by the novel's end, it is clear that she still has many struggles lying ahead of her. It's likely that she will need to reckon further with the trauma caused by the assault and the abuse she's faced. She must also cope with the sadness of losing Tony, who, despite everything else, was for a time her only friend. The uncertainty of Natalie's future is made clear by the novel's ending incident. After hitchhiking back into town, she finds herself standing on the edge of a bridge, contemplating suicide, but is interrupted when a passerby jokingly asks if she is going swimming. Natalie suspects this stranger is the one-armed man that she and Tony met earlier. Jackson's second inclusion of this figure suggests that even though Natalie has matured, she has not completely left the wonder of childhood behind. Even though Tony is gone, a small part of her lives on inside. As Natalie returns to the college, she notes that none of the people in the town are paying particular attention to her and is comforted by this knowledge, indicating that her egocentrism has finally faded. Because of this, it is easy to believe the novel's final line. As she had never been before, she was now alone and grown up and powerful and not at all afraid. Listed here are my works cited in case you were interested in further reading. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for watching.